have a very wonderful astronomer with us today. Uh, she joined LSU as a faculty like a couple of years ago. She is the only woman in the world which has a, a star named after her called Tabby Star. And today we'll be learning about Tabby Star. Uh, she finished her uh, PhD in 2009 from Georgia State University. And then for a few years she was a, she was a postdoc at Yale where most of her brilliant discoveries were made. So Debbie will tell us about her star and we learn about how a very peculiar star has a very unique brightness profile which has explanations ranging from dust clouds to aliens. Debbie? <laughs> Thanks, can everyone hear me? Okay, who can't hear me? Yay, okay, that works. All right, okay, so uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, today I'm gonna tell you something about uh, this, this project that I've been working on for several years now that's like, I love to talk about it and it's really exciting. Um, uh, this is actually our project logo here, so this is, um, uh, well, it symbolizes a couple of things. First, it's how this object was found. It was found by human eyes, so people just looking at data and they spotted something that was really unusual and they started asking questions. Uh, the second thing is what people actually saw. What, so what they saw was inside of the pupil right here, so these very strange fluctuations in the star's light output. And uh, lastly, it symbolizes like our call to action, like what we wanted to do to figure out this mystery. And that was to look at the star and you know, learn more about it and see if we can figure out what was going on. And so my favorite name for the star is the WTF star, uh, meaning where's the flux? And flux here just means brightness in astronomy terms. Uh, but it also has various other names. Um, so to get things started here, I want to kind of put things into perspective, I guess, in a historical perspective. So how many people here were born before 1995? All right, so that's about half of us, I think. All right, so this is something that's happened like within some of our lifetimes, but not within others, right? So it's, it's fairly recent in the terms of all history. And what I'm talking about in 1995 was the discovery of the very first exoplanet. So this is a planet going around a star other than our sun that was discovered. And actually just a few months ago, uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded to the discoverers of this system. And this in the astronomy community, it really upset a lot of people for various, various reasons. Um, but in kind of like the broader perspective, like just that idea of, you know, our sun having the only system with planets going around it and life and everything like that. And to have some other star with a planet going around it kind of really threw people for, you know, like they were, they were kind of taken aback by this whole idea on, you know, the Fermi paradox, you know, is there anybody out there? It just kind of brought us one step closer <coughs> to that age old question of, you know, if there are other planets out there around other stars that just makes this possibility even greater. And now here we are 25 years later and we know of thousands of these planets of all varieties and types that we've detected through all various techniques. And so again, looking historically at uh, the timeline, this is a graphic that shows on the bottom, you have an orbital period. So this is how much time it takes for a planet to make one complete lap around the sun. And then how big the planet is on the uh, y-axis here. And so this is running through time. It starts in the 1700s. And it starts populating very slowly with first the solar system. So that's our solar system planets, right? And then it goes through identifying planets that were discovered through RVs, transits, microlensing, imaging. I'm not going to go through that. They're just different kind of detection methods. But what I wanted to show you here is that as time goes on, you not just start to see more and more planets discovered. You see a variety of techniques that are discovering different kinds of planets in different parameter spaces, right? There's all those red dots that are showing up in the top left and all the green ones that are showing up in the top right. Um, and so there's, there's so many things that we can learn about these systems and so many things that we also don't know about what is normal, 
right? So once it plays one more time, so you see the solar system planets are identified here. Um, the planets that we're detecting around other worlds, they don't really fall in the same perimeter space as our own solar system planets, which is kind of neat to think about. All right, so um, looking at those red dots there that were up in the like top left-hand corner, um, this is the transit technique. So a planet detected by the transit technique is a simple point and stare and watch for something that might be aligned in your line of sight. So imagine a planetary system, you have a star and you have a planet going around that star and periodically if it's aligned up in your line of sight, it would come across the star and block a little bit of light around it. And so in 2001, this detection uh, was first made of an exoplanet and this is the picture that they took. That was a joke. Okay, so <laughs> uh, this, this isn't actually what you get. This is an interpretation. Uh, and again, this is something, a system that we had never even dreamt of even existing. This is a Jupiter-sized planet in orbit around its host star in a three-day orbit. So it is so, so, so close to its star, its atmosphere is just being scorched off as it travels around. Um, and so a bit more on this transit technique uh, is what I'm going to be talking about for the most part today. Um, the, the, you, you have a system, you have a star, and you have an alignment that's exactly in your line of sight. And this graphic over here shows in several different ways what you're looking at, right? Uh, what we do as scientists is we measure the star's brightness as a function of time, and we wait and we watch for this dip. If there is something there, we will see it. And so as you see, as the planet goes around the star and it comes across the star, it makes a perfect little blip, a little U-shaped dip in this curve right here. Um, the uh, Kepler mission was launched in 2009. This is a mission designed by NASA and it was extremely boring in the sense that all it did was it like pointed at this single spot in space and it stared there for four years, taking, taking a data point every 30 minutes of over 150,000 stars. It was totally boring. That's all it did. And so it just it measured the brightness of these stars very, very well. And it was looking for this signal right here. And just so you can get an idea of how well is very well that this, I mean, this looks easy to detect, right? Because it's a cartoon. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but the kind of sensitivity that this instrument has, if you have the Empire State Building, right, and it's all lit up and all of the blinds are open, right, and you have somebody in, uh, in one of the offices there and they draw one of the blinds down one centimeter or like half an inch, right, that is the light decrement that a planet going across a star is going to make. So this is like really, really, really sensitive measurements. All right. Um, so this is the transit technique. And uh, another thing that I want to share with you about this transit technique is how much that, that blip goes down, right, tells us something about, OK, something's happening, <laughs> tells us something about the size of the object that's going across the star. So if you have on the left hand side over here, you have a large kind of Jupiter sized planet, you're going to be able to block out much more light of that star. And so it's going to make a deeper dip down than as if you have a smaller planet. So it's not replaying. Apologize. We'll play that one more time. Maybe. We'll just do that. Yay. Okay. <laughs> All right, so if you watch it again, you have the small planet over here and the large planet over there. You have the smaller planet transiting in front of the star and you have a dip in the star's brightness that's much, much less. And so this, this data right here, that streamlining of this cartoon, the, the time versus, uh, the, the amount of light versus time, this is called a light curve. This is what astronomers call a light curve. And this is the data that came from the Kepler Space Telescope that, I mean, was super boring data set, but it ended up having such really landmark discoveries that were coming from it. And when this uh, data set first started becoming public, 
uh, we decided to do something kind of different uh, in the sense that NASA, the team at NASA has a bunch of really sophisticated computer, al computer algorithms to go and sift through this data and find these planets. And so uh, my colleague Deborah Fisher was like, hey, well maybe they're missing something and we can do something about that using crowdsourcing. And so we started a collaboration with the Zooniverse program, which is a, a online citizen science uh, platform. If you've heard of Galaxy Zoo, which is a lot of people have heard of that, that's, that's the same family here. Uh, we started Planet Hunters. And so this is to basically call on the public's help to look at real scientific data and pick out things that computers might have missed. So it's the classic like human versus machi machine challenge. And uh, yeah, our colleagues didn't really think it was a really great idea <laughs> because this is, you know, it's pretty simplistic data. Like what can a computer not miss in something that's a periodic signal? And anyway, um, well, we ended up proving them wrong. Uh, and I would like to share a couple of their discoveries with you. Um, any Star Wars fans here? Any? Any? Okay, a few? Yeah? All right, so do you recognize this place right here? What's it called? Tatooine, yeah, I heard it from over here too. So this is Luke Skywalker's home planet. This is Tatooine. And this is not something that the Kepler Space Telescope did, didn't find Tatooine, but it found like Tatooine. Okay, and this, <laughs> let, me, let me explain that a little more. So Tatooine, for those of you who are not Star Wars fans, is a planet that has two suns in its sky. And so that's what you see here on the sunset. You see a, a bright yellowish sun like our own, and then you see a reddish sun there. Um, the Kepler Space Telescope, it's not going, right? has found over a dozen of these systems and planet hunters, volunteers from the public that aren't scientists at all, they found the very first one months before the Kepler team did. Um, this is one of them that's even more remarkable. This is, this is our first what we call confirmed planet, PH1b, so we're very good at naming things in astronomy. Uh, <laughs> um, this is not just your Tatooine, so what we call a circumbinary planet. So essentially what you have, you have two stars that are in orbit around each other, right? Their pe orbital period is maybe like a week or so. And then you have a planet in a much longer orbit around those. So that's your Tatooine type system. Uh, in astronomy, we call that a circumbinary planet. Planet hunters found not just a circumbinary planet, but they found a circumbinary planet in a quadruple system. So there are not two stars there, there are four stars. We have the two in the center like this, we have the planet going around like that, and then there's another pair of stars way out here, and that's going around everything else. That's cool, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, so this is actually like what it looked like to our users and uh, the kind of scribbles that you know, they were doing, it's all public and everything like that, just kind of you know, seeing this for the first time and saying, hey, you know, like, this is clearly something that you have two stars orbiting each other, right? But there's another additional signal, signal there, what can it be? And so that was really exciting. Um, another uh, pretty remarkable thing about this project is that, you know, I, I said, mentioned before, is that, you know, we had, the humans had beat the machines in a way, uh, and that, you know, we were finding things that computers were missing for one reason or another. And so to date, there's over 60 planets that our volunteers have found independently. They're unique from any other computer algorithm, right? And, um, that when you plot them up here, on the left hand side here, I'm showing your orbital period on the bottom and up and down is how big the planet is, so the planet radius. And I've shown the position of where Earth is here and then where Jupiter is here. So that's in our own solar system. The discoveries that have been made by NASA Kepler team are here in black 
and the ones made by our Planet Hunter volunteers that are independent of anything are marked here in red. And so these, this is the kind of parameter space that we're probing, uh, kind of like Neptunish size planets with pretty long orbital periods. And it's a very, very interesting parameter space as well. So um, we move, move on and talk about the thing that I came here to talk to you about is that when you have people looking through data like this, uh, they don't have any biases that scientists have. You know, it's just like it's pure curiosity on what's this, what's that. And um, when they came across this star here, which catalog name is KIC 8462852, um, they started talking about it in the sense that if you go up close here, this is the first feature that we saw in 2009. And the volunteers started saying, well, okay, this kind of looks like a planetary transit, like those cartoons I was showing you before, you would have a drop in light and then come back up. Um, but they were also saying two things about this. They were saying that it was giant, right? So when you typically have a planet crossing in front of its host star in orbit, this lasts for a couple of hours, and this lasted for almost a week. Right, so this is what they meant by giant, not meaning like how far it went down, went down as much as a planet going in front of a star would. Uh, the second thing our volunteers were saying is that it didn't really look like that very clean U-shaped dip that we saw when, in the cartoon. It looked, had this kind of strange slope over here on the left-hand side, almost like whatever was going in front of the star was not circular like a planet. And so they noted these two things and kept on watching the star to see what else would happen. Well, unlike a planetary transit as we know it being something periodic that's going to come back around again, we never saw anything like this again. And so this is an important key to this, this whole project here is there's nothing that's repeating in this sense. Everything takes us by surprise. So this is showing the first two years or so of Kepler data. You see a couple of small little features there. They're all unique in themselves. Uh, but this one in the center here, this really got interesting here. Uh, you have this event, which also lasts about a week. It's also the asymmetric shape where you have that very strange kind of slope over there on the left-hand side as it gradually decreases in brightness up to 15% here. When you have a planet crossing in front of a star, Jupiter, the biggest planet that, that the universe could make, you get a 1% drop in a star's light. This is 15 Okay, and then it goes straight back up to normal again, and then nothing happens. So this is the four years of data that the Space Telescope stared at this star. And you can see in this very last frame over here, you have, it's gonna come, oh wait, this one. Come back. Okay. You have about 90 days of not just one transit looking feature, you have a huge complex of features. So if we look at this a little closely, right, you don't just see the single one, you see various dips with various shapes and durations and depths. You have uh, some up and downs within some of these dips, almost as if some events were superimposed on top of each other. And the deepest one here went down over 20%. So this is something over the, a thousand times the area of our own Earth, right, going in front of the star and blocking out the star's light. And then after this, we don't know what happened because the space telescope broke in, so we couldn't get any more <laughs> data. But this is right when things were getting exciting. Um, and so this is also the time where the citizen scientist, uh, remember, is just, just like everyone here, right? You know, your mom or your sister or anyth anybody looking at this and saying, well, this is really weird. And they contacted the science team, which is me. And I said, well, that's not a planet. We're planet hunters. And they said, but what is it? And I'm like, OK, well, it's probably bad data because I don't know any star that does that. And um, actually any scientist that you talk to now will say the same thing, that stars don't do that. It is just very strange looking data. Um, but I looked at it and several of my colleagues looked at it and then we sent to the folks up at NASA and they looked at it and everything about the data looked good. And so we started developing a 
a plan to learn more about the star itself to see if we could find any clues to what was happening. And so we started taking uh, data to learn more about the star and kind of put together theories on what could be happening. And the first thing that uh, astronomers come up with is, well, this is a very young star, right? It, it had just formed. It hasn't had enough time to blow away any of the material that it had formed from. And this kind of like dusty, disky stuff is still in orbit around the star. And it's blocking out the star's light in really weird ways. Um, we know of systems like this. We've seen systems like this. Uh, it doesn't fit with the data for several reasons. Most importantly is that if you have dusty bits of stuff like this going around a star, then you would also expect a glow in the infrared from uh, longer wavelengths of light from, uh, from this dust there. And we do not see that. And so this kind of threw a wrench in many, many, many of our theories. Um, including some kind of very complex asteroid belt, or perhaps you have just some really, really crazy super Saturn on steroids, right? And this object is going around your star and blocking out light. We, we've, we've actually observed one of these objects before. Uh, super, super fascinating system, but it, also, it doesn't match with the scenario that we have, or this data that we have for this star. Uh, a really fun one is that you know you have um, a, a older system that had already formed planets, and you have some catastrophic event, uh, kind of like the event that we think that formed our moon, where you have a Mars-sized object smash into an Earth-sized object, right, and blows a whole bunch of stuff apart and then you have all this debris and stuff like that that's kind of floating around your system and this is what is blocking out the light. And so each one of these has issues with matching the data and uh, in, in particular that kind of glow that you would you know expect from dust being around the star. Each one of these scenarios invokes dust that we do not observe. So we finally settled on uh, an explanation of comets. So comets in the sense that when we have comets in our own solar system, these are objects that come from way out in our solar system past Pluto and the gas giants and, and, uh, and they come and swing in towards the sun and travel back out, out again really quick. They spend most of their time away from the sun, but when they're very close, that's when they start to kind of heat up and outgas and get really big and perhaps big enough and complex enough uh, formation of clouds and material that it could produce the observations that we're seeing in the Kepler data. Well, this was so fun, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> I worked on this project for several years and finally just put it out there because, well, we couldn't really figure anything out and this was kind of like a very elaborate explanation to do it. and. Um, and believe it or not, this, this uh, story, or th this actually got some press, and I was very excited about this. Um, if you're familiar with comets in our own solar system and their connection to meteor showers, so like the Leonids are this month, I think they're next week, and uh, comets in our solar system are the cause of meteor showers here. And this is because when a comet comes in towards the sun and it goes back out again, it leaves a trail of stuff in its way. And then Earth comes in its orbit around the sun. The comet's not there anymore, but it left that trail of stuff. And that trail of stuff is what Earth goes through in its orbit, and that's what creates meteor showers. These are little pea-sized pebbles. So if you have like a giant swarm of comets, not just like a puny like our solar system comet, if you have something like this, um, we're talking about some like really crazy meteor showers if you're in a planet around the system. Anyway. Um, but yeah, so that, that was that. But things didn't really get kind of crazy or out of hand until this article came out, uh, which was based on conversations in a project that I had with a colleague of mine, Jason Wright, at Penn State. And um, I'm going to read it out to you. The font's a tiny bit small. Um, Astronomers have spotted a strange mess of objects swirling around a distant star. 
scientists who search for extraterrestrial civilizations are scrambling to get a closer look. Okay, so this is a real thing. Um, there are people out there looking for aliens. They have PhDs, they look at the sky every single night, right? And every single night it's a null detection. We have not made one yet, right? Um, uh, the work is called SETI. It's called the Search for Extra Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And uh, it's, SETI is just like a field like biology or chemistry or something like that. Um, but it's kind of taboo to have astronomers talk to people who do SETI, which is very strange because we both look at the sky. We're both kind of like after the same thing. You know, we want to learn about the universe. Um, but that's where this article came from is that, you know, astronomers, so my, my colleague Jason Wright was looking for anom anomalies in these data sets, like with an eye to, to maybe pick out something that could be weird to inform SETI searches for, you know, some kind of extraterrestrial life. Uh, we talked to a colleague of ours who works on SETI, wrote a proposal to observe this star with one of the world's most powerful radio telescopes. And the news of this proposal got leaked. And there you go. Every, yeah, it, it went viral. That's the right word for it. OK, so let me explain this a little bit more. Um, when I'm talking about uh, ET, after just showing you just some crazy stuff, it's not like we jumped the gun on anything like this. This is what we call a last resort hypothesis, right? Um, and so <clears throat> what I'm showing here are artist renditions of what we call a Dyson sphere. And so this is a, um, if you can imagine a civilization that's much more advanced than us, right? They've uh, run out of room on their home planet. They've run out of energy, but they have a sun, just like we have <clears throat> our sun. And they're looking to harvest energy from their sun. And so they start building these ginormous structures around their stars. And so this is what we call a Dyson sphere. And it, it's kind of hard to really articulate how large these things are. But if you look at kind of the smallest element on this one kind of down here, um, the distance from the Earth to the moon is a quarter of a million miles. This is at least a thousand times this size like the smallest element here. So it's, it's really, really big. So you have this you know, advanced civilization building these mega structures here. And what if you know, these things are swirling around the star? You can imagine how that would block out the light in very strange ways, right? You're convinced. All right, well, OK, remember, this is a last resort hypothesis. Um, just because you don't know what it is, doesn't mean that it's aliens. OK. Um, so two things first before we move on. Uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. All right, this is a famous quote from Carl Sagan. Also, with three parameters, I can fit an elephant. Um, what this means is that if you have something strange, and you're just you know, giving it up to your imagination to try and figure something out, you'll be able to figure something out, right? But you have to constrain your you know, ideas to what the universe says is normal. Um, and so here on the right-hand side, I have a star, this is the sun, um, and some strange looking dip in the star's brightness. And I'm going to try and model this with something that I think would work. No, well, this will play on its own. It never does. Nope. Stand by. All right, here we go. All right, this is plausible here, you know, on, on Earth, right? On, you know, uh, right before December 25th, right? If you saw something like that. But, you know, invoking that to, you know, explain other things in our universe is not 
the best idea. Okay. Um, another thing which makes this not a really great idea um, is the idea of waste heat. And so uh, we use energy just as, you know, uh, as, as we exist. Um, and so if you take this house, for example, right, this is a house in visible light, like the light that our eyes see. If we go and we take um, night goggles, right, or, yeah, night goggles is probably the best way to describe it, and look at this same house, this is called the infrared light. This is the light that I said glows if you put dust around a star. It's also the light that shines really bright if there's a lot of heat. And so if you have insulation problems in your house, so you can call a company and they'll take these goggles out and look at your house and they'll say, ooh, wow, your you know, window right there is, needs to be more insulated. Your roof is pretty insulated, your door is pretty insulated, and they can show you all the spots so you can save energy on your house. Okay, so with respect to some very advanced civilization that's using so much energy, right, that they have to like build ginormous solar panels to solve their energy crisis, um, you would expect that you would have quite a bit of this waste heat. Okay, um, and so this is another argument against like, okay, well you have something like this, we do not see something like this because we looked for it when we thought it was dust and then we didn't see that. And so um, the most obvious response from people who wants it to be aliens, right, who also says, if you, if you give me three parameters, I can fit an elephant, is that, well, yeah, but you know, what if your house was just completely insulated and you just had your back door open and all the heat's escaping there, so we can't see it in our direction, right? So there's always, there's always a way to explain things if you allow yourself um, these um, leniencies. Okay, so um, we have this very strange object. Uh, it has these very large weird looking dips in brightness that last from days to weeks. Um, lots of people started looking at this uh, and trying to figure out what was going on. An astronomer at LSU, Brad Schaefer, um, started looking at it in a different way than anyone else did in that he looked at a historical record taking the Harvard plate stack. So this is one of the Harvard computers, Annie Jump Cannon, that's what they used to call women computers back in the day. Um, and her work was based on looking at these glass plates that had emulsions on them. They put them up to the telescope, they would expose, and your data looks something like this. And that's how she took her measurements. And so they have these, uh, these archives of these plates going back until like the 1800s. And Brad Schaefer went to Harvard, you know, into the vaults there to go and look at data going back 100 years for this star. And this is what he found. So what I'm showing here is time on the bottom. So that's about 100 years there. And this is brightness over there on the y-axis. The data for our star are in the blue points, and there's some lines to guide your eye. Uh, there are data points for other stars in gray, just to show you that we looked at other stars, they were flat. We looked at this star, it showed something that we did not expect at all. What it showed was that the star was 20% brighter than it was today, looking back 100 years. Now, this is very, very, very strange, because stars just don't do that, okay? Um, and what's more, if you have uh, invoked an explanation of this kind of mega swarm of comets to explain the, you know, days to week-long dips, right? Occam's razor says the easiest explanation is the best. So if you got comics explaining the dips, then you got to explain, or you got to take comics and explain this. And so that means on the order of like a half a million comets or so, perfectly orchestrated to fall down to your star over these hundred years. So you would get these observations out. And these half a million comets are just the comets that are coming in between us and the star. So it's not to mention the ones that go below or above that we can't see at all. And so this, this whole thing is starting to, you know, feel a bit more contrived. 
Um, and it definitely wasn't what we expected to come out of it. Um, and so we have this situation where you have, you know, where is where is the flux? WTF? Like, where is all this light going? Uh, we have the top here, which I showed you from the Kepler data, these very strange brightness variations. We have these very long term variations that go back 100 years. And uh, it, it even happens recently, like these long term variations were shown to continue until today. Um, and so this is our call to action. This is where it comes in. Okay, well, we have all of this. What do we do now? Well, if you look at this, there's nothing periodic about it. Periodic things are easy because then you can say, okay, well, I predict that's going to happen then. And so we can just look at it then and then we'll figure it out what it is. This has nothing periodic, meaning that you can't predict when the next one is. There's no obvious pattern. And so in astronomy, that's very hard. Uh, but luckily we have a uh, worldwide network of amateur observers that have all contributed data to try and figure out what this star is. So basically like we want to sit on the star, take data and wait for something to happen. And when something happens, right, then we can trigger on some really intense observing, collect a lot of information and then figure out what it is. And so there's uh, a collection of several dozens of amateurs that have been contributing to this. Uh, I can tell you right now that there's nothing interesting here that's happened. There's just a whole bunch of scatter and we learned that pretty quickly uh, if we wanted to uh, act on something that we'd have to have some kind of very concerted network. And so that's where uh, this comes in. Uh, the Las Cumbres Observatory is a network, a global network of telescopes that strings together 21 telescopes uh, around eight sites around the world. They have a southern network and a northern one and they all work as one telescope. And it is, um, that's, that's all I'm gonna say about that right now. I can answer more questions later. But their motto is we keep you in the dark. So basically when the, you know, when the, um, in Hawaii, Right, when the st sun starts to come up, it's going to be nighttime in the Canary Islands. And so you can just kind of transfer your observation queue on over. And so this, for something that's not periodic, we don't know what's gonna happen next, this was ideal for us, because we can just say, okay, we want to look at this star pretty much all the time, and let's go. Uh, the problem with this is that, well, not problem, but uh, is that we had, um, it is a private network. And so our way around this is that uh, we, we started um, crowdfunding um, this project and kind of like, you know, came back around full circle to the star being discovered by volunteers to uh, folks in the community who had a couple of dollars to spare saying like, okay, well, yeah, let's, let's go and check this out. And so we got funded, uh, we got over $100,000 to look at the star for a couple of years and that's what we did. And there was a lot of waiting and nothing. There. there was also a lot of learning too. We tried to make it really fun. So this is again time on the bottom, brightness on the left hand side. Uh, but we caught a break a couple of years ago. In 2017 we started watching the brightness go down. And this was right after LSU classes ended. Right, right before my kids were like out, so they weren't out of school. It was, it was perfect timing logistically for all of us and everything. <laughs> um, because I didn't, I didn't sleep for a week after this. Uh, it, was, it was very, very exciting because we didn't know if this would happen again. Um, and so this was in May of 2017 and this graph right here, the different colors just show the different sites that were, uh, so Hawaii or Texas or uh, Tenerife. And uh, this shows pretty much all of 2017 what happened here. So you have, in the very beginning, you have Elsie, <coughs> Celeste, Scarabray, Angkor. Um, these names are not typical of any astronomer to do, like you don't name things in astronomy like this, but we felt like we could um, because naming something day 100 was kind of boring and we had all of these really interested people who supported our project and so we kind of had like a naming scheme like people name asteroids and things like that and we're able to kind of personalize this project a little bit more. Uh, so Elsie and Celeste they have um, 
uh, uh, their own personal kind of reasons. Scarberry and Angkor, I think, are pretty clever nominations for names in that uh, they're both named after these lost cities. And so the idea there is that um, something lost cities here on Earth. And uh, the idea here is that, you know, something happened to these lost cities like, you know, a couple thousand years ago. And we're really trying to figure out, you know, what's going on, like what happened there. And the same thing is happening for this star. This star is, is about 1,500 light years away, meaning that all, this, all the light we're getting now, that means it happened 1,500 light years, or 1,500 years ago. And so it's kind of like the same analogy to, to that. Okay, uh, moving on, there was this kind of blip up. I call that Angkor, so that's Wat. Um, if you're familiar with Angkor at all, there's, yeah, temple there. Anyway, and then it went back down again. Uh, and after this, it was uh, very exhausting. You know, we all kept, you know, saying, is this the new normal? That would be really awesome. Uh, and then 2018 started, we had Carl Soup and Evangeline. Uh, and those were the deepest two that we had spotted there. Um, and then kind of things went back to normal. Um, so what I said, you know, like, okay, we're gonna look at it and wait for something to happen. And then we're gonna trigger on these observations. And so we tweeted, uh, just like, you know, everyone does these days. We said, hey, something's happening. And it had an overwhelming response from the community. Uh, and this is just things after like the first day, I panic called my graduate student and I said, I need some help with this. And so we just kind of started writing a whole bunch of stuff on my board. These are all observations that we got coming from colleagues around the world. A lot of them I didn't even know. And they just, you know, were at the telescope. They were like, hey, I heard something was happening. Can I get you some data? And it was, um, it was, it was a uh, pretty overwhelming and amazing experience. And so with all of this, we wrote a paper with a whole bunch of people. And <laughs> yeah, and, and, this is what, and this is what we learned. So uh, over here on this graph, this is time. And this is the LC dip, so that very first one that I showed you. And this is the brightness. Now the color here corresponds to the color of light we're looking at. So we looked at red light, yellow light, and red light. And we did this because if you have some kind of solid object like a planet, going in front of the star, it's going to block out as much blue light as it does red light. It's just going to block all the light out, right? So you would have the same amount of depth in this dip. But if you put some kind of dusty something in front of a star, right, that's going to block out more blue light than it does red light. It's the same reason why we have sunsets. Um, and that's exactly what we saw, which is like, that's, that is amazing. So we have um, a couple conclusions over here that, well, one, people were still saying that, you know, the spacecraft messed up and, you know, it wasn't real anyway. Well, we detected it from like, you know, 50 different observatories. We know it's real now. Ha. Okay. Um, uh, also, there's no clear pattern in anything that comes out of any of the, these data sets. Remember, I said there's nothing periodic. And that's frustrating, but it's also pretty interesting. Uh, it means we just still got to look at it a lot more. Uh, we found no weird things going on with any of the follow-up observations uh, during the sequence. And um, except for this, you know, these uh, brightness in the different colors. Um, and so our conclusions were uh, this word chromatic. So LC is chromatic. So that means there are color terms that if you look in the blue light, it's different than if you look in the red light. And the amount that it's different uh, is consistent with thin, tiny dust in the proximity of the star. Science, yeah? Okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, and another thing about uh, these results, we, we've been able to look at this very long-term trends and look at that in different colors as well. And we also see that these long-term trends are chromatic. So as a different, uh, different pattern in the, in the red as it does in the blue. Uh, we're also able to learn that, you know, when these events were happening, we already had a lot of material that was already blocking the star. And so the kind of picture that we're painting here is that, okay, well, you have comets 
that are in orbit around your star, right? And they're, they're not just leaving some dusty business that's like uh, a uh, tiny trail of business, it's leaving like a whole kind of torsy ring of mess around the star. And this exists there and this is why we're seeing this very long-term trends. And these very short-term trends are from when the, the, the objects come very close to the star and they start outgassing and this is what you see. And so, um, in conclusion, uh, this is, this is kind of like the, where we're at right now with this system is that the variability, all the variability that we're seeing is probably due to dust. Um, and if you remember I said before, like it, it can't, can't be dust because we don't see this glow in the infrared. We still don't see that glow in the infrared. We're still trying to work that out because it looks like dust. And we know there's dust all over the universe. And so there's just something we're not thinking of yet. Uh, but it looks like dust in more ways that we look at it. Uh, so we just gotta keep looking. And my colleague, Jill Tarter, has this, this quote that I'd, I'd like to impress on you right now. Um, to, to learn these kind of things, to really like, you know, make breakthroughs, we need to have observations of the whole sky at all times, at all wavelengths. We just kind of need to look at everything so we're not missing out. So we don't know if this is the most mysterious star in the galaxy or if there's like a million of them out there, we just haven't found it yet, right? And we're just, you know, Mother Nature is a whole lot more creative than we are. And, you know, it throws us this thing and we think, oh, this is like, this is amazing. And then there could be like a ton of them out there. Um, we will figure it out. We just need some time. So I'm gonna leave you with um, three links here. We have um, the website where you can go and check out what the star is doing. You have Planet Hunter's website where you can go and be a planet hunter and find cool stuff like that. And then this is the only star out there that has its own subreddit. If you're younger than me, you know what that is. Um, yeah, and it's, it's pretty active. It's, it's pretty good. And we even have like a sister page of this where you can learn how to look at these data here and analyze it and come up with these light curves um, that's running through till next year also. Just found out about that. So I can take questions. Thank you. Okay, so um, there are lots of things that can go around masquerading as an exoplanet, uh, just if you have one single method to look at it. Uh, like I said, the transit method is, you know, if you're, you know, looking at the light output from a star and you see it periodically dip. Well, you can have a different configurations um, that will make it look like an exoplanet's doing that, but it's really just a double star system. Say, what if the two stars, you have one just kind of grazing in front of the other, it looks like, and so it's just blocking out a little bit of light, but it's just your alignment isn't perfect. And so there are ways to, uh, there are ways to check for this, various different ways. And that's what I mean by the candidate versus confirmed. If they're confirmed, if it's 99.9% .9 probability, it's a planet, then it's a planet. But if there is any doubt whatsoever, then it stays as a candidate. So it stays as an exoplanet. It stays, okay, so the, it stays an exoplanet candidate. So, okay. yeah. And one other thing too on your, on your brightness and your flux. When you say 0.75 to one, what are you talking, moons? What is that? <laughs> Sorry, that, that is just in fractional. Uh, so that's a 0.75 would be 2.5%. Okay. I'm, so, I'm sorry, that was <laughs> poor labeling on my part. Okay, yeah, so, that's, that's so one is 100% that you're getting all the stars light. 0. 0.9 would be 10% down, 0. 0.8 would be 20% down. Yeah. Yes? I have a question, sir, so, like, uh, this is a Uh, we don't have any gamma ray, no. Um, and the second question is, 
question I had uh, was that uh, did somebody ex like explain how it's losing this twenty percent, like like the uh, one hundred years, like <coughs> the sun itself might be also losing some gas or or something? I don't know. So the very long-term variations? Yeah, so what we think is that you have this mess of objects that's kind of strung itself out like kind of like a string of pearls because it's been like gravitationally torn apart, right? It's still in orbit around this star. And as it goes around, it's just kind of like smearing out kind of more and more of its particles in like a kind of torusy disk thing. And, uh, and that exists for a long period of time where you're having a buildup of it, and that's how you're getting this kind of slow decline in the in the curve. Mm -hmm. What do you think uh, the uh, likelihood is? Because I know there are some star systems where one star is going supernova and uh, black holes orbiting another star. Do you think that could possibly be a likelihood? Uh, that's a very good uh, idea. We have considered um, companions, so like any kind of anything next to this, this main star here uh, would put an imprint on this star itself that we would be able to detect if it was very close by from its gravitational pull. And we don't see that. Um, if you have something like a black hole in orbit around a star, um, that, contrary to what it seems like it would do, it actually makes the star brighter. It's called gravitational lensing. And so basically if you have a black hole and it's going in front of your star, it's gonna make your, yes, yes. So it kind of like focuses in. Um, and so black holes going in front of a star doesn't make it dimmer, it makes it fainter. Um, I've also heard theories about purple holes and brown holes and donut holes, and I don't believe any of those. But, huh? Until a black hole comes back out in a white hole. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, it's, uh, black holes are very massive objects, and so we don't see the brightening there. We don't see a lot of brightening in this system at all. Um, and so it doesn't really fit with you know, the, the observations that we have. Yeah? If this star went around another star? <coughs> right, so, um, so if the two stars are aligned with like, with, with your eyes, right, like this, then you would see a kind of a kind of jagged shape like that from when each star would go in front of each other. Mm hmm Yeah. What if it's something else in the orbit like where it's up to down that's eating away the star? Ooh, okay. Um okay, so the question was what if there is something else in orbit like up to down the star is eating it, right? Um Oh, it's eating the star. It's taking off parts of the star. So. Oh, I see what you mean. Kind of like uh, if there was like a big vacuum kind of sucking out the star or something. Yeah. Okay, well, hmm. Um, stars are very hot. Uh, so I don't think a vacuum would work in that sense. Um, I think that you would have uh, the same issue with uh, if you had dust around a star, if you're taking material off of a star like that, it's essentially going to give you the same signature that you would get if you had dust from planets or asteroids or something like that swirling around the star, as if you had, you know, the star stuff coming out and that's what you're seeing. That would be my guess. Well, we don't see that signature. But I like your thinking. Mm -hmm. Why is the light curve so abrupt and jaggedy if it's dust? It seems like it would be more smeared and you know, softer. Uh, well, y you have a couple of different things to think about. Um, so, uh, 
if you have just like a, a, a cloud of dust, right, you would think that that cloud is, you know, completely uniform and that would make the kind of very smooth kind of changes. Um, but I would imagine that there's some sort of turbulence within the dust. So like, you know, you would have some kind of like um, some waves in there and different densities within a cloud, right, is going to make it so you can see through different parts like further than others. And so this is going to make, um, trying to think of a good word for it, uh, more or less transparent. Right, and that's going to imprint its its patterns on the light curve, like how it changes the light curve itself. And so, if you had a cloud of dust that was um, really long, like in this direction, it could actually act just like a, a planet because no light's going to get through it at all, just because there was so much dust. And so, it depends on the geometry and kind of the turbulent factors of the dust and what the composition of the dust is. There's a lot of things that we don't know <laughs> about that, but that's what makes it really hard. We had a colleague of mine went and modeled the last part of the Kepler dips in the light curve and, and, uh, and she found with a lot of assumptions that she had to make somewhere in between 100 and 600 really giant sized comets that were just coming in towards the star during those last 60 days. And um, that, was, that was pretty extreme, but you know, you're kind of getting a ballpark estimate of like the minimum number of something like this. And again, it's gonna be higher because it's only the things that are in our, li are in our line of sight. We're not catching anything that's above or below. So it makes it harder. Mm -hmm. The star is about 50% more massive than our sun. Uh, so that's, we call it an F type star, into stars at all. Uh, it's about 1,000 degrees hotter. It's about 50% uh, larger in size, larger in mass, and it's about four times more luminous. Um, compared to like all the kinds of stars that the universe can make, Right, our sun included, all the way down the cool ones, the really evolved ones, the dead ones. This is pretty normal in the whole spectrum of things. So we wouldn't say it's kind of like our sun, it's still a little bit bigger and hotter, but it's still not extreme star. It's normal everywhere, the other way you look at it. Those stars are amazing. I love them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is not quite that large. It's still very much like our sun. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, so as it's moving, so could there be something that's as it's going fast or somehow coming near the star that that star is burning it off and thus expanding that kind of reflection? <laughs> or I mean that, you know, that you're getting that drop? Like the drop in, in, the, in your okay so yeah so the idea is we have some some icy piece of something from way out in the solar system and as it approaches the star it starts heating up right. and that's when it spits out like a bunch of gas and stuff like comets here in our solar system right but what if it's going around and around and as it's doing that it's getting you know it's releasing more so it's getting more dense as it keeps I mean, that's what you're talking about? Yeah, so that's, that's the picture that we're trying to paint. We're just trying to see if the, the physics actually <laughs> works right. with it right now. But the, you know, the, the data that we've taken point to it's some kind of dusty stuff. And so we're, we're trying to make that work. And we're still looking. Yeah. Uh, that would be caused uh, primarily by the shape of the object that's going in front of it. And so you would get a very symmetric drop off like I was showing before. If you had a, you know, your star is a circle and you had a circle going in front of that, it would make a symmetric drop. You would get kind of an asymmetric shape if you had something 
that was, uh, you can imagine, say, like a triangle shape or something kind of going in front of a star. You would block out a whole lot of light first, and then like, and then it'd be gradual up, or if you had like a backwards triangle, it'd be the other way around. Um, and so you can tell a little bit about the geometry of the object in that sense, but again, like somebody else has mentioned before, you also have the transparency of an object if you're talking about something that's super big, then that's, yeah, they're all minimum things. Yeah? Uh, could it be just a very dense nebula that's going around the sun? Uh, the, a nebula in the sense that um, would be a kind of dusty cloud of, of stuff. So a, a nebula is, um, let me start over. Um, we, we need a mechanism to get that nebula in place around this star. So nebulas typically happen in certain environments where you have uh, so stellar nurseries, you have you know, nebulas there where you see these stars borning, uh, being born because there's lots of clouds of gas and dust and, and business there. Um, you also have nebula where there are stars at kind of like the end of their lifetime and they're puffing off like a bunch of uh, material from their atmospheres. Um, and so a, a nebula around this star, since this star looks so normal otherwise, it, it doesn't, I don't think it gets as nebulous um, observations from that. Like the, it's, gotta, it's gotta have some kind of origin. We're just, we're not really sure what it is, so. Ooh, that's a good idea. Okay, so um, the question was, is there any uh, way a, a moon could cause these fluctuations? Um, so there's actually been some recent work done uh, on this idea in the sense that, so uh, our, our own planet Jupiter has these four moons called the Galilean moons. And there are these big icy bodies that Galileo spotted with his telescope um, back in the day, and so they were named after him. So this this you know giant planet with these four big icy moons was kind of taken as like a, a, an idea to to model this after, right? Okay, so you have um, something happening to Jupiter and its moons, and Jupiter gets flung down into the sun, right? It goes away. And then the moons kind of stick around and they're big, these big icy bodies and they can produce the same kind of things that, you know, or they could produce the same kind of things that we're looking at. And recent work has shown that, yeah, we can get the physics to work out for this, which is pretty fascinating. So we actually have a mechanism to put something in place that could possibly do that. Way to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, um, that's a loaded question. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> all right, so if you, let me put this back, just like a couple slides. Come on, where are you? Okay, at the top right here, I'm showing the full, where are you, spotlight. Right, so this is four years of data up here at the very top. Right, if you take that feature in the center and then that feature over there, and you take the difference in time between those, it's about two years. Um, taking two years and making and putting an object around that star in a two year orbital period, um, that would be in the habitable zone, which is what astronomers say that uh, it's the region where liquid water could form on a planet. Um, and so it's an interesting, you know, 
place, not saying that that is the same object as that or anything like that, but that's kind of like, you know, something that came out very quickly is like, well, you know, I mean, if this thing is periodic and things are changing and, um, you know, throughout time, then, you know, you would have something that is in a very favorable place. Um, and so there's that. Uh, I forgot the second half of your question about the alien hunting. Okay. Yeah, so I actually went alien hunting. Um, it was fun. Uh, we, uh, we went to this, this place called Green Bank Observatory and I actually have the, the water bottle that says the universe is whispering to us. Okay. <laughs> um, so we went there and uh, we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't find anything. But I'd, li I'd like to tell you a story from that, if, if you don't mind. It won't take very long. So we're looking at, uh, we weren't looking at the star yet. We're looking at kind of like test sources in the sky and uh, to do calibration checks, see if our instruments were working. And so, you know, the operator said, okay, we're slewing to Mars. And I'm like, why are you going to look at Mars? And, um, and so, we're, you know, data came in and we're kind of doing a quick look on it and they were like oh wow whoa looks look look at that and uh we saw this kind of streak in the image right so you have this kind of um uh this yeah this this peak coming in at kind of a varying frequency that was very uh, uh incremental and um it ends up that we had found intelligent life on mars like <laughs> Yay, like everything worked. Okay, so, um, so we've put ro robots on Mars, right? There's robots on Mars. There's like little ro rovers and there's like things orbiting Mars. And so then those things, they like beam stuff back to Earth and so we can communicate with them and back. Okay, so we looked at Mars, right? We detected these signals that it was sending back to Earth. We just intercepted them. And so like this, this, what that, that moment when that happened, I like finally, I think, understood what it's like doing some work for SETI is that, you know, you're, you're not trying to talk to the alien civilization itself. You're just kind of going to try and get some leaked communication during this time. And, and so, I mean, you could look, you know, all day today, but there would be no leaked frequencies until tomorrow. Right, and so that's why the quote at the end of, you know, you need observations all the time of all the sky at all frequencies, because, I mean, it's, it's pretty practical to think that you're gonna miss something if you don't have something like that. Okay, let us thank our speaker again. Go Tigers! <laughs>